Welcome once again. We're glad you're with us. And you have, in case you're wondering, reached Unstoppable Mindset, the podcast where inclusion, diversity, and the unexpected meet. I'm Mike Hingson, your host. And today we're interviewing Tanja Malevich. And Tanja has a varied background. She is involved with a company called Get Braille. Um, she's a voice actress. And she's going to tell us about the rest. I looked at her bio, and it's a nice long bio. So there's a lot of data there. So rather than putting all of that here in the podcast, Tanja gets to talk about it. How about that? Anyway, Tanja, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. How are you? I'm doing well, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, and it's it's Tanya, but uh, Tanya. Okay. A lot of people think that think it's well. Once you know, again, like I, I I should have <laughs> asked because like with uh, with Malevich, I. I just listened to what Jaws said, and it said Tanja. So Tanya, yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited, uh, and of course, with your story being so inspiring too, I you know I look forward to helping the community itself and in uh, many different ways, including providing Braille access and easier Braille access, more affordable quality all that fun stuff. And of course, contributing to the world of voiceover and AI voice cloning. Well, let's start with kind of your history. Tell us about growing up and where you were born and all of that stuff. So I was born in Serbia. Um, I came here to the US at the age of five and a half because I needed some various surgeries, honestly. Um, when I was born, I was a preemie premature baby and I had retinopathy of prematurity. So we needed to um, perform surgery right away to see if we could reattach the retinas. They had been detached due to the oxygen, the incubator. So my mother was able to uh, gather enough money, fundraise, and bring me here to the U.S. at the age of one. We had the surgery. That was very successful. And then we came back to the U.S. periodically to get eye drops, medication, and check-in. By the age of five, these checkups were so frequent that we decided to settle in the U.S. Uh, it made a lot more sense to do that, a lot more cost-effective. So that's what we did. And I went to public school here. I had the fortune of getting all of my schooling here in the U.S. And then many other opportunities as life went along its journey. So... I was a dual learner in school. I did large print braille. And then of course, when screen reading technology was more easily obtainable, a lot of audio, JAWS, voiceover, all that fun stuff. And I'd say my vision. Yeah. Not to do much, but give your age away. But how, when were you born? What year? 1989. So, so by amazing. that time, by that time, ROP was pretty well known. Um, so. That's right. There was no choice but to put you in an incubator with pure oxygen or what? Well, I mean, you're looking at a, not a third world country, but but definitely a country that was economically struggling with the war going on and such. Mm -hmm. And the care really wasn't equal access to everyone. It's sort of like what you could get into, you know, what opportunities were available to you. And at the time, they had all these premature babies in incubators. That was just the way it was done. They didn't have enough staff to really monitor, and I sort of question whether or not much of the staff really cared all that much about it. Um, it's not like you could go to court and sue them and really get anywhere because they would laugh you out of the courtroom. So with limited opportunities, you kind of took what you could get. Yeah. Well, having been born in 1950 when ROP or at that time RLF was not nearly as well known or certainly not accepted, although it had been offered as a reasonable issue dealing with premature babies, it still wasn't totally accepted by the medical profession. And I've heard that there were people born around that time who like 30 and 40 years later sued and won. And I always felt why would I want to do that if the doctor didn't really know or it wasn't that well known? What are we going to do by then, filing lawsuits other than destroying lives, which doesn't make any sense because my life was not destroyed. It just went a different way. Right. I mean, that's a great way to look at it. And I see it as a blessing in disguise because it was a great opportunity to bring my family over one at a time, close family, and 
get them jobs here. Well, not that I got them jobs, but they were able to have the opportunity to better themselves, their situations and so on and have family here, which is a much more attractive alternative than being in a country that's economically struggling, war-torn, et cetera. At the time, we got out of that conflict just just in time because it got yeah. worse from there, obviously. So having the opportunities to have public education here, all of the various services that were offered here at the time was just unheard of. The School for the Blind that existed in Serbia was very 1800s, maybe 1950s style, institutional-like, dark rooms, dirty, just not a place you want to be. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's a great, great opportunity for us. So I, I, that's how I see it, instead of worrying about lawsuits and trying to yeah. get revenge or whatever. <laughs> Which uh, makes perfect no sense. Point. Which makes perfect right. sense. Do you, do you have siblings? I do. I have an older sister. We're 17 years apart. So the running joke is she's my mom. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I think we go to the store and, oh, your mother can help you with this. Like, this is my older sister, but don't say that to her. <laughs> uh, <laughs> She'll be offended. Your, your big sister. My big sister, yeah. Yeah, that works better. Yeah. So you... So you did get some eyesight back from the operations and yeah. how did that work for you in school? Uh, it was in a way it sort of got me into trouble. Uh, not that I wasn't grateful for having the vision. It was just that my teachers were like, well, she can read large print, you know, if we magnify them enough and give her the video magnifier, they called it a, CCTV at the CCTV, time. Now yeah. it's just called the video magnifier. But they gave me access to one of those. Like, well, she doesn't need Braille because, first of all, we have to pay a whole ton more. We got to pay another person to come in here and work on Braille and whatever. She can get just get by with large print. And it was a struggle because after 45 minutes of trying to see the larger text, it hurt my, you know, I'd get a headache. My eyes would start tearing. I My neck, shoulders, all that you'd get uncomfortable sitting in, in such a weird position for that long. Um, so we had to fight with the school to get them, the public school, to get them to agree to get me Braille services so that I learned Braille and print and had both in my toolbox, if you will. But also I would argue that the language barrier was just as much of a hindrance as maybe the lack of understanding of, hey, this is a dual learner. Because when I first started first grade, uh, they put me in a school that was like more special ed versus some teaching someone who was blind. It was more like they had kids with various disabilities. And so the, the teaching style wasn't a good fit for me. Uh, I did learn English and like grade one Braille, which is for anyone that, that's listening that may not know, is uncontracted Braille. It's long form. You write everything out a letter at a time versus using contractions and condensed bro, which saves a lot more space. So I knew that, but it wasn't a great fit because I wasn't being challenged enough. And one of my teachers found that out in first grade and they pushed for me to get moved to a, a, a different public school where it was more of a general ed system. So I had a year where I was kind of like stuck in first grade for two years in a way that was good because I had a chance to learn more of the language and Braille at the same time. And then I was more prepared to move on with the curriculum. But in a way, it also sort of held me back. It was a little bit awkward uh, for me because I was like, wow, I'm older than these kids here mm -hmm. <laughs> in my class. So a, a couple of different challenges, but the way that I like to look at it is that it, the more skills you can gain from tough spots you're put in, the better problem solving skills you might have or advocacy for yourself later in life, especially if you see that it's a, it's just simply a matter of miscommunication. And as long as you explain things to, to folks around you correctly in a way that resonates with them, it's got to resonate with them. It can't just make sense. They've got to sort of personally understand what, what it is that you mean and see the, the struggle, I guess, if you will, then you're better off doing it that way. Then what do you what do you mean by that? Can, what do you mean by that? Can you kind of explain? I, I'm not sure I follow totally. So a general education teacher is busy. They don't have the time to 
stay after school every day with you and work on extra things. If you can prove to them that giving you an assignment ahead of time or giving you the notes on the board or maybe even expressing to them what's confusing about you and setting a time that works for them, you're going out of your way to show that you're dedicated to their class. They personally need to show that their students are succeeding or they're going to have to explain why it is that that they that they've got so many struggling students they're responsible for many kids all at once and you're just adding more stress so the more solutions you can provide to them the easier their life is and their job is and the faster they can get out the door because we all have lives and families and you know so proving to the school through anecdotal evidence that this is hiring someone else is just gonna present their teachers with less obstacles is the way to go, um, at least for me, from my experience. Just well, showing effort, showing evidence. And it worked? Yeah, yeah, it, eventually. <laughs> yeah. Well, how did the teachers react as you started to explain? I would assume that that helped. It did help. Uh, I did run into some other snags where the teacher of the visually impaired I was working with at the time had a lot of her own issues in her own life day to day. So for math and science and so on, I was writing my, showing my work, writing a lot of the answers in Braille, leaving some space. So double spacing everything so that she could interline it with print, which means writing the print above the Braille line. So then the teacher could go ahead and read it. It was an extremely antiquated way to do it at the time. That was the option. Now, of course, we've got all kinds of technology and Google, you know, Google Sheets and whatever, all this other more efficient ways to do it. But the point is that it took her a couple of weeks to get these assignments back to my general education math teacher, for example. And that slowed me down because I'd fall behind. I'd be maybe a chapter behind everybody else. I'd still have to pay attention in class, but they were well ahead of where I was. So, you know, I was I was having a hard time keeping up. This was like fourth, fifth grade. But it was just another exercise in workarounds and figuring out how else we can do this. I'd show my work in print on the CCTV instead of the Braille. Um, I would find ways to print out material that I wrote off of my, something called a Braille note or a Braille light at the time, which is just like a, a small computer essentially that has a braille display you can feel one line of braille at, at once it's electronic it stores files you can change the file format and i'd print out my stuff so i came so up with a couple of faster ways to do it and what it's called and what it's actually called is a refreshable braille display because as new lines display or new lines um are called for the dots pop up representing those lines so the display constantly refreshes for those who don't That's understand that so it's a way of now producing Braille in a much more portable way. The one disadvantage is, as Tanya is describing it, you only get one line at a time because it's a very expensive process. The displays are not inexpensive to do. So over time, hopefully, we will find that someone will develop a really good full page Braille display, but that's a ways off. Yeah, it's still pricey technology. I'm not I do really hope there we can get away from ex- pins. Yeah. We need to do something different than we do. Definitely. The pins get dirty, broken, et cetera, stuck, and it's very expensive to replace them. Yeah. And that's part of the hindrance there. But it is still a lot more portable than carrying a number of volumes of Braille books. I remember when I was For in sure. school, <laughs> when I was in school, I we ordered a catalog case from Sears. The catalog case literally was a case where you would put catalogs and carry them around. If you were selling things, you could take catalogs to people and you could put a bunch of catalogs in this case. In my situation, we used it to, so that when I went to school, I could carry some Braille books. And I got three or four volumes of Braille. So that carried Braille for a few subjects, but of course, very bulky, very complicated not easy to do and certainly right. not refreshable not at all uh, i did that for math science history 
uh, especially a lot of the charts. The mm-hmm. way that they did it was they'd have thermoform charts and all the rest of the text was done in Braille. And so you had like not only the volume of the, the chapter Braille text, if you will, but you also have a separate volume you're carrying that has all the reference figures associated with that chapter. So you're carrying two volumes as opposed to where you could just have the one, three, two, three, four sometimes. And for those just who for don't- one subject. And for those who don't know what thermoform is, thermoform is a process where you create an original of something, whether it be drawings or even documents on paper, and then you buy a machine called a thermoform machine. You put a blank piece of plastic in the machine lying on top of the Braille sheet, the original Braille sheet. You activate it, and a vacuum pulls down the two sheets together, the Braille with plastic on top of it while it heats them and the plastic then takes on the shape of the braille document below it so it's a way of relatively quickly producing a number of copies of a braille book or as tanya said the in her case the diagrams and so on of course it's still not inexpensive and thermoform isn't like using your fingers to read braille pages the plastic feels different and it it's a little more awkward to use, but still, it was a fast way to get Braille, comparatively speaking. That's definitely true. Um, the main issue with thermoform is your fingers eventually go numb because it's a glossy type paper. And if your hands are sweating, it, it, it can inhibit your ability to run your fingers across the page. So that makes your hands go numb faster. So sometimes putting some sort of powder on your hands can help but the well the drawback to that is it dries your skin out so there's always positives and not so much uh, to that process but it is a more inexpensive way to produce tactile graphics see you sighted people think that you know you have problems in dark rooms trying to read stuff you're not the only ones who have reading problems um we all have our challenges don't we <laughs> oh for sure all sorts of <laughs> creative challenges that we yeah constantly iterate on to improve and we do iterate and we do improve which is of course the real point of the whole process so you went off and you uh, went through school where were you living in boston or where so we were living in initially when we came to the u.s we lived in south boston for a bit then we moved to chelsea we were there for about 10 years then everett and then now i live in peabody but relatively same area of the country. So I spent I spent three years in Winthrop. Oh. East Boston. Hmm. It's a nice yeah. that's a nice area. Yeah. It's fun to be there. Well, yeah. then you you went on from school to college. Yeah. I went to Simmons for my undergrad and I studied communication, special ed and writing, um, literature specifically. So that was a great experience. Their disabilities office was extremely helpful. I initially, before applying to various colleges, I did a couple of interviews with their disability center, a couple of phone calls. I wanted to get an idea for myself of what their process was and how willing they were to talk to me about it. So the fact that Simmons was not only transparent about their process, but also willing to answer any questions when I'm not even a prospective student yet, told me a lot. So yeah, I I did have a good experience. So what did they do or say that caused you to like their office and their process compared to other places that you observed? Well, I mean, for, for one, it wasn't some email that was automated or like oh, I don't know, now now I guess you could joke and say they're gonna send you to a half an hour recording that you have to watch. It wasn't anything like that, where they were just trying to um, automate everything. I spoke with the one of the directors of the disability center there at the time, and I, I asked all kinds of questions, like how far in advance would you need these books? If if that process falls through, if the professor changes the books or a new professor comes into the class. Because these things happen all the time, you know, depending on what happens in life. Uh, they told me, well, that's that's okay if the book changes. We can work with you, the publisher, 
or you can try to purchase the book um, online used and then we can just scan a chapter at a time if the the crunch time is on and you've already started the semester get it to you within a week as long as we have a syllabus and we know what the timeline looks like for these chapters and then we bring in the professor and make sure they understand there's a letter of accommodation the professor has to sign that and understand what they're reading and then if they cause trouble later you can point to the letter and say I'm not making this stuff up. There's evidence to support that I need this accommodation for this reason. You signed off on it. Can we work together on this? And it cuts that cumbersome miscommunication down quite a bit when you do it that way. So the fact that there were several processes in place made me feel a lot better. I'm the kind of person that likes to have plan A through like E or F, just in case. As <laughs> as we know with tech issues nowadays, uh, we got to have yeah. multiple options. One of the things so just that the confidence there was really what drew me to, you know, they knew what they were doing. They were confidently able to answer my questions. They understood why I was asking them. They weren't getting annoyed that I had 50 questions. And that's really what sold me on it, if you will. One of the things that I experienced when I was at UC Irvine was our office basically said, we're here to help you and be the muscle and power if you get a lack of cooperation from professors and so on. Um, but if you need material transcribed or whatever, um, this is, of course, long before offices became more organized, but you'll probably need to be the, the person to find the appropriate transcribers. Well, I worked with the California Department of Rehabilitation. We found transcribers and we found people to do that work uh, because the office didn't do it. But what the office yep. basically said was, you need to learn to do this stuff anyway, because we're not here and other offices and facilities aren't here when you go out on the job. Right. That's a huge consideration is um, whether or not you're able to easily find people that can transcribe, especially if it's like a math class. So I, I'll tell you in college, I avoided languages, math, hardcore, because after high school, I had lost, you know, like you don't just have that library available to you, you can just order from. I think the Ames library, right. which is a common library that, that school systems use to borrow various textbooks for students once you hit college you're kind of on your own in terms of finding out how you're going to accommodate these tougher classes i math wasn't my favorite subject so i tried to avoid that in high school i took spanish and german for languages and because i had done that there was a possibility for me to take multicultural electives in that place in place of that and i took a test to opt out of like the generally because my my major didn't require math so i opted out of that by taking a math test and then i took an intro to computer science class and i i worked a lot with partners uh on certain tasks that were non-visual that were or excuse me that were that extremely were visual, visual. Yeah. yes because there was just no other like you get into the class you don't have a lot of time to figure out how you're gonna make it happen transcription takes a while as you know, so unless you have this well in advance, it's going to be a scramble and you'll likely get the book later into the semester. And then it's also a question of who's going to pay for it. It's quite a bit of money. Does the mass mm -hmm. commission pay for it in this case? Does the school pay for it? And I didn't want the headache to, you know, to, to be frank about it. So I avoided it. Well, I understand. How did you find partners to help with different projects like that? <laughs> A lot of the time, the professor would just assign somebody in the class. But um, a couple of the classes, I got on with a few of the students sitting near me. Maybe all of us were pretty well introverted. So we didn't have a whole lot of people we, we talked to. And also Simmons um, is a school that has adult students. It's got, you've got, you know, people in the master's program taking maybe some other electives that are also available to undergrads. So that nice mix of culture really gives you more of a mature group to work with. So partnering with students wasn't too hard at all. 
The operative part of that, though, is that you did the work to find a partner. And I know there are some... Sometimes. Yeah. Well, what I'm getting at is that, like, there are colleges where offices for disabled students says, oh, we'll find you those people. But then you have to work by whatever their rules are. And you learn how to do that yourself. They did have that available. For example, if you needed a note taker, which in my case, I didn't. But if a student wanted a note taker, they could request that some some student say that signed up for a work study job fill that position that student would go to your class with you take the notes send them to you whatever it is that that they got to do um sometimes there would be a reader that you could get access to same kind of deal a uh, work study position the student would work with you for maybe two to three hours a week and they'd get paid for it but the problem with that was you sort of had to coordinate your schedule with their schedule. If your class wasn't in a spot that in a space in their schedule that was open, they couldn't work with you that day. So it, it was more of a hassle than it was worth. And yeah. I didn't need a reader at the time. I just scanned a lot of my stuff in and would work with a professor or ask if I wasn't clear on something. So and you, yeah, I, you I avoided that too. You did a lot of it. That is, you did the work to to make it happen. In other words, you learned the skills that would help you later on once you got out of college. I am grateful for that because when you get into the world of work, it's nothing but figuring out how you're going to make something happen and make your boss happy. So it's a good skill set to have. So what did you do after Simmons? So I went to UMass Boston, which was a, the program was mostly remote. We went in a couple of times for intro classes and um, labs and things like that. So I initially started in the TVI program, which is Future of the Visually Impaired. Then I switched to VRT, Vision Rehab Therapy, which is uh, the difference is that TVI works with students up to age 22. And sometimes they can work with adult learners, too, if they're working for a commission or a blindness center. If you're a VRT, you're working mostly with adult students teaching them daily, um, basically daily living skills, braille skills a little bit, recreational, et cetera. So I switched to that program midway through. And so I was at UMass Boston for five years and then got my master's there. And that was, a, like I said, mostly remote. There are a couple of things that I liked about that and a couple of drawbacks. For example, you didn't really get that same class feel when it was all remote, as I'm sure everyone mm-hmm. can attest with COVID. Yes. <laughs> being on Zoom and do- Zoom PowerPoint by Zoom, right? Um, PowerPoint death. But <laughs> yeah. but the point is, yeah, I I had a lot of experience um, in person, asking the professor questions right there and then. With remote, you really couldn't do that as much. And I ran into some more accessibility snags, like test taking, getting the software not to time out on me or jump my focus around the page. So I worked around those and we made everything work. But the main, the main thing was now with labs coming in, getting a partner to work with was a a little bit tougher at that point because that relationship that you build when you're in person in school wasn't a thing. You're posting online, you're replying to people's comments and posts, but it's not really the same thing. It's, you're just kind of doing a lot of work on your own. So you feel isolated. And then when you're there in person in a lab, you're like, well, now I have to work with these people, uh, get enough information from them, and they don't really know you. So it's a lot more communication that has to happen. And the only thing that I'll say that I wish was a little bit longer is some of these labs. We had a little bit more time to do them. Other than that, you know, did run into some accessibility issues. Their disability center was a lot more slower and had a lot more red tape around it. Their processes were a little unclear and ever-changing. So I did have a, a struggle with that in a few cases. But hey, uh, long story short, I graduated, so I'm happy. When you were growing up, before you got into college and so on, did you have a career goal in mind? What did you want to do when you grew up? Huh, that's, a, that's a great question. I think a lot of the time I wasn't really sure. I was kind of bouncing from various things. I'd always enjoyed acting ever since I was a kid. You know, I 
really admired good actors or who I considered good actors' performances and liked the genuinity that they brought. Maybe not all films are meant to be genuine, like you can think of anime or cartoon, they're over the top. But when something is very believable that you get in touch with a character, you feel like they're real, that's the kind of thing I wanted to emulate and also just living vicariously through them. So when I discovered that voice acting was a thing um, in high school, I was like, oh, this is exactly what I want to do. I'd always been interested in it since I was a kid, like enjoyed making home movies, recording. I used to have a tape recorder when I was a kid, bring it around everywhere and annoy the crap out of <laughs> everybody in my family, <laughs> ask them questions, record little stories. It was just creative fun. But I, I always thought if I could have this creative uh, vision or creativity be part of my job, I'd be very happy. Never enjoyed the idea or prospect of being a drone. Not that everyone working in an office is a drone, but I just found the idea of sitting behind a desk doing the same thing over and over and over again, with absolutely, you know, no freedom to make any decision about anything was, was completely suffocating to me, the idea of that. I always wanted something where I could move around, work with different people, enjoy it, really challenge myself and work in a team to make something awesome, like art. That's not really a career per se. It's it's a hobby that turned into a side gig that now with working with Resemble AI, it's a embedded more so into my day to day job where I'm recording different voices for them and so on. It started as like one of those, this would be cool if I could do this. And then this is fun. I'm going to do this as much as I can and kind of more and more experience in networking. And then Did otherwise, you... um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, otherwise, I really want to give back to the community because I'd always been a consumer of audio description and um, Braille services and these, like the mass commission and my various Braille teachers and mobility instructors who made lessons a lot of fun in high school. They didn't just make it boring, go across the same street every single week. It was like, no, we're going to go to the store and learn how to solicit for assistance and whatever. We're going to forget about these cardinal directions, which I got sick of. But the point is, I, I enjoyed so much. I couldn't be the person I am today without the services that I've taken advantage of my whole life. So just the idea of giving back and helping other people, making their day a little bit brighter and helping them understand that we're all going to have bad days. That's never going to go away. Uh, the grief, if you've lost your sight, is never going to go away. Grief never does. But you know that it's going to be better. If you're feeling bad one day, you know it's, it can't be like that forever. Something will surprise you. And if you put it out there enough, things are going to improve. The universe always seems to put out what, what you expect eventually. Not in the way you expect. But it will happen some somewhere, somehow. And those two things, I feel like now I'm finally at the point where I've gotten both of them to be a reality. So the big question of the podcast is, you made all those recordings when you were growing up. Did you keep them? Some of them. I <laughs> have some of the tapes. <laughs> it's... Some of them are so terrible and overdramatic, but it's it's amusing. It's like, just you can tell I was just having fun. And then the recordings through the years, as I got better with voice acting, kind of took part in different shows. I did save all of those just because you, you would be sure. surprised. Or maybe not. Maybe you wouldn't be surprised. But a lot of producers will lose things. They'll put something on the back burner, like a project. And then three years later, oh my God, I'm trying to work on this project. I have a lot more time now. Life got a little less busy. I don't have the recordings anymore. My computer hard drive died. Do you have, have not? You know, that happens a lot. And then data, it's easy to, to just keep a bunch of it, a bunch of data. Well, as I recall, if I remember the story right, the movie Lawrence of Arabia starring Peter O'Toole, Academy Award winner, but someone on the line, the, the master was lost and somehow it was recovered but even an academy award film uh, things things happen exactly they do so that's why i have backup hard drives i have like two or yep. three of them and i just back yep. everything up 
<laughs> I also I, enjoy I, audio drama, so I can collect those. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite? Oh, that's a tough. I, oh, I don't. No. What, I don't even know. Tell me some <laughs> of the audio dramas you like. Um. So, is there a genre you're thinking? Do you are you thinking nope. modern or? Well, that's a that's a really hard question to answer. I I could go based on categories, but um, there is a version of Lock and Key that was done on location in Maine. Lock and Key, of course, anyone listening will. Well, if you're a Netflix person, you'll know that it's an original series on Netflix. But there are books that were written by, I believe it's Stephen King's son and and Stephen King. And I'm a huge Stephen King fan. So they wrote uh, this, I think it's a series, it might be three part or something. Quote, honestly, don't quote me on that. But hmm. there are books. It was written as a radio drama and adapted by someone called Fred, Fred Greenhalgh from maine and they recorded on location that a couple of days they did this it's a six-part audio drama it's available on audible it is so yeah. good so i've got the audible copy and it, it is it oh was, you do i didn't even cool. know what it was going to be like um when i got it but it it is it is so well done i'll um, tell you a secret. it's way better than the netflix series ah I collect old radio shows. I collect old radio shows as a hobby, and I've been doing that cool. for a long time. And um, you you see all sorts, anything from good to bad. But that is a, a okay. lot of that has spoiled me for some of the acting that I've seen in more modern dramas because the same level of emotion isn't there. People, a lot of people today, don't know really how to act and produce an audio drama that conveys, I think what the author originally intended in the book or the way it was done with old radio. Um, we just, sometimes we don't see the same quality, but I remember lock and key and it does. That is true. It's not always the same quality. I think that we're trying, we're really have a couple of different avenues where we're trying to fix that. Like there is something called the audio verse awards. They happen every year. There are different, obviously, iterations of this uh, out there, but the Audioverse Awards really strives not to make it a popularity contest. Yeah. It's a crowd voting system. People go in, they listen to various things. You've got awards for sound design and acting and writing and music production. Everybody gets recognized, which is important. You can't just recognize the, the writer or the actor because right. it's, that's just a tiny piece of the pie. So... And it's a good place, I'll say, if you don't know where to start when it comes to listening to good audio drama or at least vetted audio drama, it gives you a lot of choices and you can find these things. And then you've got people ranking the quality of things on blog posts and all kinds of yeah. places there. Well, Gunsmoke, yeah. the Gunsmoke, the Western, they call it sometimes the first adult Western in radio. It was on from, well, all of the 1950s, um, constantly won awards for sound patterns, sound effects. And exactly. if you listen to it and compare it even to other old radio programs, there is so much more sound put into it. Um, it's They did a, an incredible job of really setting the scene and creating the atmosphere with with the sound patterns, with the sound effects. So it wasn't just the acting, which was so good. I know. I know. I mean, they got some talented Foley artists there. Yeah. And yeah. And I mean, another one with sound, obviously, that if we're thinking of classic, maybe not as classic as Gunsmoke, but the Star Wars NPR. I version. was thinking of, of that. Um, yeah. And the, the Star Wars program is pretty well done. And the acting is good um hamill did a did a great job that's him absolutely i mean there are other star wars radio dramas in that world that i can think of but none of them compared to that npr version there's, there's the Hobbit another too. there's another program that npr did uh, that was on for three years called alien worlds which was well done oh you know i think i heard that one yeah well, if you I want mean, the BBC to, does some great stuff, too. They do. Oh, so, they do a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Yes. 
I I think my biggest frustration is that there isn't one central directory where you can find all of this stuff and keep up to date with it. You have to go on this website and this website and this directory and there's no central data like data collection system where it's like, oh, I want to learn about the history of audio drama and I want to know what's available now and in the past. Like archive.org excuse me, archive.org is e- extremely helpful because you can just search keywords and find a bunch of stuff that was curated, yeah. downloaded, cleaned, like Nightfall. Amazing, amazing series yeah. from 1979 to like 1981 or 1982. I think they only had 104 episodes, but they were really Canadian horror series. Yes. Half an hour. Really, really good stuff. Anthology. So actually, you, a lot of it was ahead of its time. Yeah, um, as we've seen so many times. Well, Gene Roddenberry was way ahead of his time as well. Needless to say, mm. yeah. So you've done a, a fair amount of voice acting, I gather. A bit. <laughs> have we have we <laughs> heard you anywhere? Been, you might have. Um, I mean, like for example, some of the longer run stuff going on it's edict zero um some some may be familiar with that it's a science fiction cyberpunk series it's almost like fraser meets x files it's really (laughs) good mind-bending stuff you know our world is a simulation kind of thing a lot of Uh fun that's been running i don't know now nine years what maybe more it's crazy uh there's what's the frequency which is kind of a cool fantasy horror contemporary show um that is one season i think we're going to be working on season two so far there is i do want to mention the 11th hour project is a great place if you're new to audio drama you want to dip your feet in maybe you want to try your hand at producing or writing or something you've never done it before it's an extremely inclusive space it's 11thhouraudio.com and if you visit that you'll notice there are obviously shows that have been created but what it is, is it, it's a challenge in the month of October to create audio dramas from start to finish and collaborate with people you've never collaborated with before in this project, this team effort. And it's a race to the deadline. It comes out on World Audio Drama Day, which is the 31st of October uh, in recognition of World the Worlds, originally 1938. And it's a lot of fun. I've been involved a couple of years there. It's a wonderful community. They're extremely welcoming. The moderators are great. um, And they're always available to answer any questions. So I totally recommend checking it out. And then other other stuff, Vast Horizon, The White Vault. There's a group out there called Fool and Scholar Productions. And while we're on the topic of sound design, Travis Vengroff, who is uh, one of the integral members or founders of that group, won several awards through the Audioverse Awards, um, specifically I can think of, for sound design on Vast Horizon and The White Vault and some of his other shows, like Tales from the Tower. So these are all... uh, Vast Horizon is a horror-slash-sci-fi show that's about this agronomist who wakes up on a spaceship. The rest of the crew is just gone. They're not dead. There's no bodies, no signs of struggle, anything like that. They're gone, but the ship is breaking apart. So she's got to figure out a way to get to some sort of station. And the only entity she can interact with is the artificial intelligence on the ship. So I play the artificial intelligence, which for me was a a huge like dream come true, I guess, if if you will, because I've always been fascinated with it, artificial assistance and all that. And using a screen reader, I mean... I know a lot of my friends who are visually impaired love to imitate screen readers just because it's funny. <laughs> so, and so I finally got to do it and get like a dig out of it. That was awesome. And then and the what's white the name of that one again? Vast Horizon. Vast Horizons. Okay. Yes. Uh, and, and it's it's singular. Vast Horizon. Horizon singular. Correct. Okay. Yeah, you got it. And then the White Vault is a survival horror show. First person accounts basically compiled, but not what you would imagine from seeing a lot of these similar kind of tropes, if you will. This is a truly international cast, and it takes place all over the world. And they get actually authentic actors from various countries. It's not like, oh, and I want you to do 
um, a British RP accent and whatever. It's it's actually people from there. And there are languages also being represented, other languages like Mandarin and um, you know Icelandic and, and so on. And they they do it in such a tasteful way where the language starts, then it fades down, then you have the voice actor speaking in English. They got translators. I mean, they really put a lot of thought into this. I highly recommend it. And it, you can binge all five seasons now. Uh, Vast Horizon, you can also binge all the seasons. So if you need some listening material, <laughs> yeah, fun road trip stuff. And those are a couple of the projects. I mean, there's others, but, you know, they just take, take, me, <laughs> take me a while to go through those. And with all the languages, I assume nobody, though, has done Klingonese yet? Not yet, but they did just do checking. Serbian. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's not, not Klingon, yet. but that's okay. <laughs> well, Klingon is actually fascinating. Yeah. It's, yeah, if, uh, it, just real quick some aside on that. Yeah, if you're interested but, in, in learning about how the Klingon food scene is, is done in the next generation, I think there was a recent episode where they had this whole banquet and such. It was like this. Yeah entity to look like an octopus basically creepy alien looking there's an episode of gastropod where they go into it's called gastropod the podcast and they talk about food in the context of science fiction and fantasy and how writers work is has been brought to life either in books or in movies and they talk about star trek they actually have the lady who designed the set and the food like that is literally her job. She designs this food to look perfect on camera, and also so that the actors aren't like chewing too much or whatever. There, it's fascinating, and that's just a talk podcast. It's not audio drama. So, what's been the biggest challenge for you in your career so far on the job and all that? The biggest challenge, I'd say, is the ever-changing technology, software, tech stacks, soft phones. CRMs, <laughs> you name it. Like, it, you know, you learn one thing, or maybe a company starts using a new tool just because it works for them and it's a good, um, presents good workflow. But not all the tools are usable with screen reading technology like JAWS, like NVDA, VoiceOver. And there's this constant need to adapt and learn how to come up with workarounds and explain to your boss, I understand why you want to use this but i'm unable to access that because of these inaccessible um barriers that i'm running across how can we work together to make it work and sometimes it's well let's collaborate on google sheets and then i'll post the results up here on this tool that we're using for instance resemble uses something called notion it's a fairly early tool in its development it's mainly designed for writing and it's Think of Trello. It's like cards that you move around and those denote tasks completed or in process. You're able to put in notes. It is not accessible <laughs> at all. So a lot of these workarounds is just, you got to have a lot of communication, make sure that people are on the same page. And so we also use Slack. Um, and then my solution is Google Suite because mm -hmm. it, it bridges that gap a little bit. We can always post a Google link in one of those Notion cards, and people can access the same info. How do you like Slack? So yeah, that's that. It's the best solution that I've run across so far in terms of keeping track of threads and channels. But there are definitely some things that are a little cumbersome with it. Um, yeah. for, for example, sharing files when you're on the desktop version. If you're trying to download files that books have sent you, Giving into that to see the file, sometimes when you tab, basically, you're, so, so imagine this, you're on the name of your colleague, and they've shared two files with you. You're going to hit tab to get into the list of files. Sometimes all it does is say bold italics. So then mm -hmm. you have to shift tab into the field, press your up arrow once, it'll start reading a bunch of stuff. You ignore that, you tab once, get to the files. Each time you open the modal dialog to download each file, and then you hit the close button once it's downloaded, you're brought right back into the message field and your focus is no longer on the file list. So then you have to go back up, repeat, tab past the first file you've downloaded, rinse and repeat the entire process, and it just slows you down. 
So I find in some ways Slack is very clunky, but it is the best it's, solution when compared to others. <laughs> it's really good at being able to have a lot of channels and so on. My biggest okay. challenge with Slack is that if you have to monitor a variety of channels, it's not at all trivial to go from channel to channel quickly. You just spend a lot right. of time looking through channels to find Absolutely. nuggets or information. And that's an awkward thing. It's, it is not, it is um, it is more linear from a voice standpoint than is is really helpful. Yeah, I mean, even reacting, like I find it much easier to react to posts on the phone than on the desktop app. Yeah, and switch between workspaces on the phone. Um, uh, my other thing to bring up is notifications. I feel like Slack doesn't always notify you, right? Even if you're mentioned, sometimes it's easy to miss. So, like you said, you have to sit there and hunt through all the channels to make sure that someone isn't trying to get your attention. And, who so, and has sometimes that I just want to be like, can you, right? I just want to be like, can you email or text me or call me? I will yeah. get all of those things. Yeah. Just don't bury somewhere, but it's so frustrating sometimes. Uh, yeah. But it's better than Discord in terms of monitoring channels, I've noticed. Discord's accessible, but it's not very usable in a lot of ways. So you use a guide dog, I understand. I do. What caused you to decide to use a guide dog as opposed to just using a cane? I've always loved animals. Um, you know, when I was a kid, we we had a farm or we lived on a farm. Oops. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, there we go. So as a kid, we lived on a farm and we had chickens, turkeys, uh, we had a pig and so on. So a lot of my job was to collect the eggs and, you know, take care of them, whatever, feed them. So I grew up with animals um, and then, you know, I had birds as pets and so on. I really wanted to have my own like dog. And my mom was just like, well, I don't know. I mean, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of responsibility. I don't want the dog in the house. She wasn't a fan of the hair, the shedding and the responsibilities and the costs. So when I found out in high school that I could get a guide dog, you know, I could apply, get one. And then I talked to some other folks who already had dogs, like my real teachers had dogs. I got to see them every day and I got to see them working and they were just so good and very caring. And, and there's nothing like a special bond between a guide dog and their handler where the dog trusts you implicitly and they love you unconditionally. So it's just such a, such a, it was such an attractive, like, oh, I'm going to have my own best friend with me in college. And also the fact that you could travel around a lot easier. The dog could follow people in front of you, get you through a store a lot quicker, find doors, elevators, stairs, street crossings, as long as you knew the route, you were good to go. So I loved that whole thing. And I decided to apply because I wanted to have a furry friend I could bring with me to college. College is intimidating when you're in high school because you're like, well, how am I going to make friends? I'd always had trouble sort of connecting with peers my age. I always found it easier to make friends with folks who are older than me than people my age or kids. You know, kids are, are fine too. But it was just that whole awkward of like, if I, you know, you're the only person with a visual impairment in your school, people are just like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go do my own thing. <laughs> so when I got a dog, you know, I started college. It was a game changer in terms of helping me not be so so sad and like down, just like being yeah. far away from my family and being in this. They gave me in uh, freshman year. They gave me this room that was a, like for one person, and it was like a cell. I kid you not. It was tiny. It was in the corner of the building. I'd had a tiny closet and just enough room for you to spin around with your arms out, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. So I was very sad. I was just like, wow, I feel like I'm in a prison cell and I can't like see family or anybody. I, I feel so isolated here. So having the dog was huge for my mental health and not getting depressed uh, too bad, you know? So I got the dog for a number of reasons. I mean, socialization, huge. Uh, people yeah. would talk to me, want to pet the dog. Like they cared about the dog, not me. But it didn't matter. It's still... <laughs> I still did what I had to do and I could get them to help me in certain situations, like in the cafeteria, if I needed help. 
or whatever, finding a certain classroom. I could get peers to help because they're like, oh my God, it's dog. I'm like, if you help me find this classroom, you can pet him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked out really well. Yeah. I just um, loved having the companionship. I got my first guide dog going into high school and that was oh. before I even learned to use a cane, but I was very knowledgeable about travel and a, a dog has mm -hmm. made a lot of a difference in what I oh, do. Yeah. And a dog's, well, a dog, dogs in general have taught me a lot about teamwork. I love to say that I've learned more about trust and teamwork Good. from working with eight guide dogs that I've learned from all the business and management experts in the world because dogs do love unconditionally, but they don't trust unconditionally. And what you said yeah. was true. They trust implicitly, but only if you earn their trust. And yeah. they likewise have to um, earn your trust and you have to learn to trust them. It's a two-way street. But when yeah. both members of the team trust each other, it's a sight to behold. And it makes all the difference. And, and, and there is something to be said for the fact that it's good to have somebody to keep company with, you know? Oh, definitely. I mean, both of my dogs, I feel so fortunate I've had. Wendell was my first dog. The hardest thing, though, for me is like, I get so attached to them. And I, if they're, if they're like sick or they're getting older, I just worry about it and worry about it. And if there's something, that I wish it's that their lives were longer. Yeah. And also I've just had dogs with health issues. My first dog had inflammatory bowel disease, cancer and kidney disease at the end. And it was traumatizing. Like mm -hmm. we had to, unfortunately, you know, put him to sleep and stuff. And after that, it just affected, it, it still affects me. Like I mentioned earlier, grief doesn't go away at all. Mm -mm. It's just how you deal with it. And you have to understand they, you need to accept it. It's part of your life, and you're always going to remember them. And you got to you got to give them the respect of remembering them fondly and appreciating them right. for what they gave you. Right. They're, they they gave their soul, the, their spirit for you. You know. You can dwell on the disease, or you can dwell dwell on the bad yeah. things, or you can dwell on the positive things and all the things that we learn together. And one of the things that I've learned yeah. through now eight guide dogs is wow. That when one, awesome. I got my first one in 1964, so it's been a while. But uh, you know, when when they grow older, they become ill, and you have to get a yeah. new dog. It doesn't mean th that you think any less of the the dog who can't be your partner anymore. But you form a new teaming relationship, and your relationship may change if you keep the old, the other dog, which we generally have done. But still, the relationship is there. And what you really get to do is to get two dogs used to each other so that they interact. And that's a lot of fun. Um, yeah. And I've had, I've had two dogs gang up on me. So which dog do you think I am? <laughs> I want to go to work today, for example. Aww. Oh, oh that's they're so sneaky. sweet. They're sneaky. <laughs> oh, that is well, so Tanya, sweet. Well, Tanya, this has been a lot of fun. And absolutely. I really appreciate all your time and, and insights. Um, if people want to learn more about you and voice acting and so on, how would they do that? You can check out my website that has samples of my work at www.tanya, T-A-N-J-A, M as in Mary, voice.com. That's Tanya M voice.com. You can email me at Tanya, T-A-N-J-A. 631 at gmail.com or you can check out get braille where we offer braille large print and audio services at get braille.com g-e-t-b-r-a-i-l-l-e.com you can also find me on linkedin facebook all that fun stuff reach out honestly anytime i love to help folks get started with voiceover and just meet new friends in general so don't hesitate so, so get braille is a company that produces alternative forms of material other than regular print. Correct. Yes. We were able to produce uh, Braille, large print. Uh, we do menus and various overlays for business cards or in interior like certificates and diplomas, interior signage, all kinds of whatever material you might need. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of overhead like some of the other Braille production houses might. 
So our rates are affordable and our work is, is quality. So I've had seven years of Braille production experience at Perkins School for the Blind, and now I'm starting my own chapter in that regard. So it's an exciting journey. Sounds like a lot of fun. What? How do you produce the Braille? What do you use? So currently I'm using Duxbury, which is uh-huh. more of a literary Braille translation software, math, so on and so forth. And I run that on Interpoint embossers, which produce Braille on both sides of the page. And so we also use clear plastic overlays that we can, as I mentioned, business card overlays or diploma certificate. And we're also looking into getting a better embosser, like a Tiger Pro and the Tiger Suite to start producing more tactile graphics. Uh, That is needed. I think that's a huge need. And looking to um, upgrade as, as we resources allow. Cool. Well, Tanya, again, thank you very much for being here. And for you listening out there, I really appreciate you. And I appreciate you being here with us again today. Please give us a five-star rating. We appreciate the the ratings. Um, Your input is extremely valuable to us. If you know anyone who you think would be a good guest, and Tanya, you as well. Uh, If you think of anyone who would be a good guest on Unstoppable Mindset, please email me at Michael H-I, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I, at accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E dot com. So I'd love to hear about guests and just your thoughts about today's episode and the podcast in general. You can also visit our podcast page, www.michaelhingson, H-I-N-G-S-O-N dot com slash podcast to, uh, to see more of the podcasts if you're not finding them wherever you're looking right now. But again, thanks for being here and listening with us today. And Tanya, once more, thank you very much for being here and being a guest on Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you, Michael, for having me and for the listeners out there. Thank you for listening. Please, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to to help if I can.